Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. Hope your night or day is going good and everything's going well with you. I was going to go over these passages of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and it will have to do with the sovereign grace of God in our lives and why we have come to believe the gospel. So starting here at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Now, Paul here is saying that the gospel has an effect to certain people, to people that are being saved, and this would be through the course of time. People that hear the gospel and are being saved through it, it's the power of God. Now, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. Those people that are perishing, the gospel has a certain effect to them. It, it is just foolishness to them. Now, in the next chapter in this same book, Paul will tell us, that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot understand them, because they're spiritually discerned. That the natural man, that is the man without the Spirit, can understand the things of the Spirit, because they're spiritually discerned, that you need the Spirit of God to understand the things of the Spirit, otherwise they're foolishness unto you, and you cannot understand, and you cannot accept them. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. This is in direct relation to the gospel. For the gospel or the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So those who are being saved through the gospel, through the course of time, the gospel has a certain effect to them and it has power. Remember in another passage, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, we know that God chose you because our gospel came not merely with words, but with power, deep conviction, and the Holy Spirit. He said that we know that God chose you because our gospel came with power, that the gospel is power to those who are being saved, that we know that God chose you because our gospel came not merely with words. In other words, it wasn't just an empty message. It wasn't just foolishness to you. It wasn't just mere words but it came with power, deep conviction, and the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit was there with power, causing deep conviction that this message was true. And so you have come to know Christ because of that, because of the conviction of the Spirit, because of the power of the Spirit chose you to be saved. And that's what he's saying, brothers and sisters, we know that God chose you because our gospel came not merely with words, but with power, deep conviction, and the Holy Spirit. That we see that the Holy Spirit has been working on your lives brought deep conviction so that you have come to know and believe the gospel. Therefore, we know that God has chosen you. As it says in Isaiah, you are my witnesses, declare the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. Before me there was no God form, nor shall there be after me. I alone am the Savior. So very clearly we have the pre-incarnate Christ saying he has chosen people to know and understand and believe. And this is the doctrine that the Apostle Paul taught. Brothers and sisters, we know that God chose you because our gospel came not merely with words, but with power, deep conviction, and the Holy Spirit. That Paul knew that God chose people to be saved, and there was a sanctifying work of the Spirit on them, so they would believe in the truth. Brothers and sisters, we're always bound to thank God for you, loved of the Lord. From the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and belief in the truth. That from the very beginning, from the very beginning of time, God chose people to be saved, so that they would believe in the truth. So the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To the ones who God is saving throughout the course of time, God gives power to his message, to the gospel, on the ones that he's chosen to be saved. So in verse 19, it goes on to say, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And remember, the reason why this is, is Jesus said, I praise you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to little children. That he's revealed these things to the little children. He's revealed things that have to do with the Spirit to his children, but he's also hidden these things from the wise and prudent. That he's hidden these things from some people and revealed them to others. The wise and prudent would have to do with those who are wise and prudent concerning the things of this world. You see it go on to say, where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? 
Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For in, since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to bring to salvation those who believe. For Jews require a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto Jews a stumbling block, and unto Greeks foolishness. But unto them that are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we see it says, but to them that are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That the ones that are called, Christ, and that message has power to them. Now to Jews, naturally, this message is a stumbling block, and to Greeks, it's foolishness. But to both the called, both Jew and Greek, to the ones that are called, it is the power of God. We know from Scripture that this purpose and this calling of grace was decided by God before the commencement of time, that he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So before the ages began, from the very beginning, God had purposes of grace, which he would then call particular people, both Jew and Greek, individuals into salvation, and we'll see that coming up. So the next verse says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And I believe this is just talking about from the human perspective. It's not saying that God has qualities of foolishness and weakness, but that from the human perspective, as they hear this message, it just seems foolish that God would bring this, and it seems like a weak message to them. And what we're seeing from the scripture is that there has to be a calling, there has to be a regenerative work on people so that this message isn't foolishness unto them, that it has power, that it's not weak, but it actually has power to them. And that's why Paul in the next verse goes on to say, For see your calling, brethren, by consider that this message had power to you, that it wasn't weak, that it came with power, it came with deep conviction, it wasn't foolishness. For see your calling, brethren, how not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty according to the flesh have been called. But God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the mighty. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the debased and the despised things God has chosen and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, that no man may boast before God, but by his own doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. So to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, that the scripture is showing us that the ones that God has chosen and called from a, both Jews and Greeks, the gospel will have power to them. See, there's a calling on particular individuals from both Jews and Greeks to where the gospel will have power to them. But to those who are perishing, the gospel will be foolishness. The gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to the us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To the ones God is saving, the ones that are called, both Jew and Greek, it is the power of God. So the ones that are called, Christ and the gospel is the power of God. Remember when Jesus said that his sheep will get a personal, individual, factual calling. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one will snatch them out of his hand. I and my Father are one. So Jesus talks about how his sheep will hear his voice, and that's what the Bible means when it says, Consider your own calling, brethren. It's on the ones that God has chosen. And we see the ones that God has chosen and called, the gospel has power to them. But to the rest, it's a stumbling block and it's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the wisdom of God, the power of God, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So we can see very clearly from this context that God has called us and chose us to believe the gospel, where others have not been called, others have not been chosen, so it's foolishness to them, it's a stumbling block. The ones that God has chosen and then called, Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. To both Jew and Greek, to those who are called, Christ the wisdom of God, the power of God. 
See, if you're not called, if you're not one of the called, Christ is not the power of God. It's not the wisdom of God. They just see it as a weak message of foolishness, that the gospel is foolishness to those that are perishing. See, if a person is hearing the message of the gospel through the course of time and they're not believing, then they're not appointed to eternal life. You see that in the book of Acts where it says, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. When it says that the Gentiles, when they heard this, they glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, speaking of the gospel, that they were hearing the gospel, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, so first they were appointed and then they believed, the free will position is that you believe and then you're appointed to eternal life. First you believe and then you get your appointment to eternal life. The Bible is given the very opposite order. That when the Gentiles heard this, they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So first comes the appointment for eternal life. Then comes the believing that God has a divine election on people that he's called and chosen to be saved. So now we'll go over to the next chapter. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the original letter. It's just uh, one single free-flowing thought. So we'll go ahead and go over to the next chapter. The chapters were added later in the, the numbers so that it would be easy to find verses. So go ahead and start here. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit of God, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So if you can picture what Paul is saying here, he's saying that I was before you, I was in fear, I was trembling, my speech wasn't very good, it wasn't very excellent, I didn't come with this persuasive words of human wisdom, but yet you believe the gospel. Yet despite all of this, outwardly failures, my simple preaching of the gospel, you believed it, so that your faith would not rest in the power of men, but in the power of God. So that your faith would not rest in men, it would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That the reason why you have faith is not because I persuaded you, but because God persuaded you by his spirit, that there's a sanctifying work of the spirit on the ones God has chosen to be saved. And somehow, despite the fact that I came with fear and trembling and I was with you in weakness, not with persuasive words or excellent speech, you still believe the message that your faith does not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, that your faith does not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, Paul's message is that when he gave the gospel, it was God who caused the increase and the growth. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. See, Paul is saying there's nothing that I did that ultimately convinced you that these things were true, but it was the power of the Spirit of God working in the people that God chose to be saved. Brothers and sisters, we're always bound to thank God for you. Loved of the Lord from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and belief in the truth. So Paul is preaching this simple message about the cross that has to do with Jesus Christ coming and dying for sins. And Paul knows that his sheep will hear his voice, that when this message is preached, that those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ will be the wisdom of God and the power of God so that their faith should not stand in the wisdom of man. In other words, don't believe that you were convinced by me and what I did, because remember, I came to you with fear and trembling. I didn't have excellent speech or worldly wisdom, but yet you believed it. That's because your faith does not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's why you believe. He goes on to say, however, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that have come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So if you think about all the Jews and all the Gentiles there that were seeking to have Jesus Christ crucified, demanding his execution 
they did not know that he was the Lord. Remember what Jesus said, nobody knows the Father except the Son, and nobody knows the Son except the Father and who the Son chooses to reveal him. That nobody knows who he is, that's a universal claim. Nobody knows unless he chooses to reveal himself. Notice that the gospel is a hidden mystery. It's a hidden thing to people that if our gospel be hid, it's hid to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they cannot see the light of the gospel which displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. But God ordained it before the world began for our glory, for our glory, the ones that God has called in this context, the one that God has chosen, the one that God has called, he has ordained it beforehand for our glory. It would be hidden from others, but revealed to us. I praise you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to little children. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained beforehand for our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but we have received the Spirit of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. I'm going to stop right there. Notice how it says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit that is in him? That when it comes to somebody else, you don't know what they're thinking. You don't know what's on their mind and what's the, on their heart. You could be standing next to a serial killer and not even know it. If you think about all the people that stood next to say John Wayne Gacy or Ted Bundy and had no idea of what was going on in their mind and in their spirit only they did only they knew what was going on inside themselves for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit which is in him in the same way it says no one knows the things of God except by the spirit of God so the only way that we can know the things of God as if we have the Spirit of God. And we have not received the Spirit of the world, but we have received the Spirit of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, before time began, God chose people. He would then call people. He foreloved people. He then died for those people on the cross. And now he's waking those people up by his Spirit, that they may know the things that have been freely given to them by God. What the scripture is showing us is that we could not know the things of God, the deep things of God, unless he had given us his spirit, because no one knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. But we have not received the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit of God. So the scripture is clearly teaching here that we could not know these things pertaining to the gospel and to Christ unless the spirit of God was revealing them to us. And that these things are revealed to the ones God has chosen and the ones he has called in this context. That there has to be a spiritual work that you have to be regenerated. God's spirit has to be regenerating you so that you can understand and believe these things. And we see that in the next verses, which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So in context here, it's in direct relation to the gospel and the cross, and it's saying that the natural man, the man without the Spirit, cannot understand these things, that you have to have the Spirit, that there has to be a regenerating work of the Spirit revealing these things so that a person can know and understand and believe. And that's what Jesus said. You are my witnesses, declare the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. That without the spirit, you cannot know, you cannot understand, and you cannot believe. The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. That is the man that is not born again. The natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned, that you need the Holy Spirit. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, these things about Christ and the cross. 
for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? That is, unless you're some kind of mind reader, you do not know what's going on in somebody else's mind and in their heart. In the same way, nobody knows what's going on in God's mind and his heart unless he reveals those things to us by his own Spirit. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but we have received the Spirit of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. So in these two chapters in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, what we see is that there is a particular individual effectual calling by the Spirit on the ones God has chosen to be saved. And he reveals things about Christ and the cross that we could not know unless we had his Spirit. He hides these things from people in the world and he reveals them to others. I praise you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to little children. So we see that we could not know and understand and believe these things concerning the cross and the gospel in Christ unless there was the Spirit, unless the Spirit was operating in us, the ones that God has chosen to be saved, which we see that in the scripture, brothers and sisters, love to the Lord, from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and belief in the truth, that there is a sanctifying work of the Spirit on the ones God has chosen to be saved where he reveals things about the gospel and the cross things that apply to his sheep. So these verses are very clear that the natural man cannot understand, know, and believe, that left to ourselves we could not save ourselves, that God and his Spirit came and saved us by causing a regenerating work so that we know and understand and believe that he is he. You are my witnesses, declare the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. Before me there was no God for him, nor shall there be after me, I alone am the Savior. So Christ is the Savior in every way. He has caused us to know, understand, and believe the redemptive work that he has applied upon his sheep, those that were given to him before the foundation of the world that will come to him through the course of time. As Jesus says, all the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no wise cast out. A definite statement that all the Father gives will come. They're given before they even come. He says they will all come. All the Father gives to me will come to me. They come because of a sanctifying work of the Spirit that they would believe in the truth, the ones God has chosen to be saved, his witnesses. That they would know and understand and believe that he is he. So I'm going to wrap this up here, brothers and sisters. I hope you're having a great day or night whenever you watch this. So God bless you. Peace to you. Take care. Gonna be here soon.